statistically, only a small number of API students attend screened or quote unquote prestigious schools. Um, the schools can be overcrowded and underfunded, and they, they're just not being able to be the best for every student. And there's also large populations of APIs who face barriers, linguistic, socioeconomic barriers to their educational success. And furthermore, all students experience the detrimental effects of like, um, say, a curriculum that is like Eurocentric, it doesn't explore more cultures, lacking teachers and role models to reflect their communities and experiences, and experiencing structural, structural racism as well as racial bias in their schools. So that's why we're not only saying that integrated schools are nice to have, which they are, but what we're saying is that segregated schools violate students' rights in education. Integrating schools isn't a separate uh, mission from making schools better, from equipping schools with resources to support their students, um, equipping schools to respect the students' cultures and backgrounds. This is all the responsibility that the city has to its students. Hi, y'all. My name is Sarah Medina Kamasholi. My pronouns are she, hers, and I'm an attorney at Public Council, a former public school teacher and the former founder of Integrate NYC. I'm going to give a quick update on the case. Last May, the New York court dismissed Integrate NYC, claiming that the court lacks power to intervene in cases where students claim that school officials take action that violate their rights in New York. We we assert that this is not true, that courts have the power and have always had the power since Brown versus Board of Education to address when schools discriminate against young people. We have filed an appeal to a higher court and anticipate a result this year. We will keep you updated and informed on social media. I'll pass it over to my colleague, Victoria. Hello everyone, my name is Victoria, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a director with Integrate NYC, uh, the lead plaintiff in the case, Integrate NYC versus New York, and I'm going to share some personal experiences today that relate to our discussion regarding segregation and the model minority myth. The issue with segregation is that it fosters an us versus them mentality. It reinforces negative stereotypes within specific communities. And when our schools are segregated, it provides an institutional structure that teaches racism. Youth interconnection becomes undeniably strained. However, youth have the power to stand up as a united front. In fact, in 1965, it marked the largest youth-led civil rights demonstration right here in New York City. And by the 1970s, CUNY students continued to build upon that momentum in organizing demonstrations for support of open admissions and integration. We are building upon that foundation for integration and because discourse must happen and the fight is now and solutions must occur. And I'll pass it to my colleague, Melanie. Hi, my name is Melanie. My pronouns are she, they, and I am in program director here at Integrate NYC, the lead plan plaintiff in the case Integrate NYC versus New York. I am also gonna be sharing some personal experiences today that relate to our discussion. The oppressive structures of our school creates tension between students. The systems of segregation have become so deep that students are pitted against each other for opportunities and resources. It forces us to turn against each other. Recently, I was in a discussion about the school admission system. I was talking to a group of Black, Latinx, White, and Asian students about how unfair school admissions are, but not for the reasons why I think it's unfair. Several students remarked that it's easier for Black and Latinx students to be admitted in what's defined as a good school. It was in that moment I realized how more efficient the education system is at dividing than repairing harm. There was reinforcement in harmful ideologies such as the model minority myths. The belief that stemmed to divide communities of color regardless of the racism and oppression the communities face. These systems set in place are working to segregate communities at an alarming pace. In the moment of discussion, I felt angry. Looking back on it, 
I realized how we shouldn't be divided. We should hold space for unity. Not all students have the opportunity that I've had to work with Integrate NYC to learn about the inequalities in the diverse space. Every school should create the opportunity. And that's why I'm here. For youth, the case means not only diversity, but inclusion as well. Understanding the issues of this case, implementing the five R's of real integration is the only holistic approach. A world where students feel safe, valued, and secure. I believe that we are now going to move into Q&A. Is that correct, Naomi? Okay, great. Yes, I'd love for anybody who has any questions. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Paula Keeley. I sit on the Citywide Council on Special Education, and I appreciate the update and all the information um, and recognize the struggles that we have, you know, ahead of us in terms of continuing this conversation. Um, I wanna kind of center it around the community that I serve, which are students with disabilities and students with IEPs. You know, um, as of last year's data, we are actually serving the same amount of children who identify as part of the AAPI community um, who are receiving like special education services. We are servicing over 11,000 students that identify that way and that's the same amount of students that are either in or have applied for this uh, um, specialized high schools. So it's like, you know, when we're talking about apples to apples, you know, it's like where, you know, the, these are these are um, students that are not getting the kind of attention as those who are registered for the specialized high schools, right? Yet they're still struggling with getting services, with getting their um, evaluations done, because, you know, as we recognize, uh, a lot of members of the AAPI community are not English language learners. So to have someone who is not bilingual assess their child is not doing them a service, right? It's like they're automatically going to relegate that child as an English language learner, you know, or that they need speech and they don't have a speech impediment. Um, so the services aren't even being recommended equitably. So I just wanted to like kind of ask the collective voices here, you know, through Integrate NYC and, and CACF, like how can we support um, those families, because honestly, like, you know, being a grassroots organizer and, and, you know, doing this on a citywide level, the way I've, I've been kind of chipping away at the, the, you know, the misinformation that's being circulated about the, the model minority and, you know, um, and like, you know, the SHSAT is like, you know, it congruent to the identity of the AAPI community is talking to those families and letting them know, you know, for every household that has a child who is a gifted and talented child or is going into a specialized program, we have another child in that same family who is struggling, you know, and they're not being diagnosed and they're not being given the, the proper support. So chipping away at the monolith, ha that's kind of been my path into it. And it's like, slowly but surely, we're getting more of that information out. And, you know, these parents are, are you know, they're desperate for support. So, you know, um, you know, CACF can do so much you know, for our community in terms of like educational support, but like, you know, we have people in our, um, you know, in our community that are struggling with, with, um, you know, mental health support, recognizing that, you know, because of the environment that our children are learning in, whether it's in a specialized high school or not, you know, the, the, the need for emotional support is, is prevalent, you know, we're losing more and more of our kids to suicide because of the stresses that they're under. So, you know, if there is a way that CACF can be a conduit for that, you know, especially like, you know, the knowing the challenges that our AAPI community have when it comes to language access, when it comes to, you know, um, you know, the, the, the cultural, you know, um, challenges that we have, you know, our, our, our communities tend to be very close to communities. They don't really like outsiders, right? So, you know, having an organization that's recognized like CACF being able to provide that additional support, you know, for families with IEPs, for families going through the IEP service uh, process, for families who are searching for that 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 parent support, you know, when their child is going through an emotional breakdown, um, I think is is kind of like a, a void that um, your organization can definitely fill, and it would it would be integral in terms of bringing families who are not aware of this conversation that we're having 
to the table to have that conversation. Thanks so much for bringing that up. It sounds like you're doing really important work. And I've just been, while you were talking, I was thinking about um, CACF's approach to, um, um, approach to education equity for students with disabilities. And I think there's like the policy side, but as you said, there's also like the cultural, the cultural aspect to raising like this sort of awareness. And I think that where they overlap, um, somebody else can chime in on this, but I think that where they overlap is the idea that um, IEP services are a right, right? Like, um, we already know that like, oh, all students are different and everybody has a different learning style, um, which often comes up in these discussions like, oh, some students just need um, these accelerated programs because they are, because they are naturally gifted, right? Something like that. But IEP services for students with disabilities also serve to accommodate a student's like needs and learning style. And those are like legitimately a right, right? And I think that um, trying to move in terms of like changing people's minds, trying to move the conversation in those terms, like what are the public schools like legally mandated and what, well, what should everybody be getting out of a public schools is the way to start that conversation because these are all intersectional um, issues, especially, um, especially the overlap between um, students who um, don't speak English and students who have disabilities. Paula, can I just um, make sure, um, I, I want to repeat the question back to create access for other folks on our panel here. Is the question, um, how do we really think about API students with disabilities in this conversation? And how can we create space and honor that unique experience? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, I just wanted to offer one framing. You know, I think when we're talking about advocacy, there's in the courts and there's outside of the courts as well. And um, both are equally as important. And there's a particular um, resource that I've found helpful, particularly um, that came out of UCLA and is um, the, the center is cited in the litigation, but um, they had a report specifically on double segregation of ESL learners and I'm in, in English language learners. And I'm interested in, you know, how framing sort of double and triple segregation for certain groups of the API community may be a really helpful way to, to communicate that intersection and to maybe bring parents into the conversation who don't believe in the racialized segregation or who don't believe that they are they might be experiencing it but can really understand on a visceral and experiential level the other forms of segregation whether it be language or ability you know the other thing i wanted to elevate too is cacf is doing such amazing work around disaggregating data once that data is disaggregated, that triple segregation, if that's the term or that's the concept that you're interested in, could be very, very powerful as well. Um, and so I just want to offer that framing and I'm very happy to send resources um, your way. It hasn't yet been applied to the API community, but to brainstorm together with you. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. I think there's a question in the chat for some of the youth on the panel. The question is, some people may not realize that youth care deeply about these issues. What ways can youth organize or get involved in actions around school integration? Um, like you were saying, uh, Sarah, there are like a bunch of different ways um, to advocate, um, like whether it's like legal action um, or other actions and I'd say like one way that is like um it's like less of like in like in action but um kind of more of just like a practice I think just like um talking um about issues in relation um to the five R's 
um, and integration and equity, um, like just having those conversations um, in your school spaces um, because um, you can like really try to change things on like a small level at your individual schools. Um, like if you feel like um, strongly about like if something like feels unjust um, in your school community, um, there are like ways to really advocate um, for equity in um, like small spaces um, like that. So um, yeah. Are there any particular events or organizations or anything like that, that any of the youth on this panel would like to plug or elevate towards that end? Um, since you mentioned it, um, Integrate is holding a youth justice fair on May 20th. The name is still to be determined, but um, really we want to invite youth to talk about um, real integration and restorative justice and even more things. And we really want this fair to not only be integrate holding it, but we want to invite other organizations. So if you're part of one and you feel like your organization can really add something, please feel free to reach out to um, execs at Integrate NYC. I can drop down the email in the chat. Um, but yeah, we really want to hold space for youth in that. And we recognize that also youth participating in advocacy and activism in like organizations is hard if you don't have access to it. Um, I was able to get access through like my middle school and I'm very happy that I was. So like also recognizing that um, for youth to be part of this movement is really important and essential. I also wanted to elevate Peer Defense Project. And Paulette, I think this is responsive to your question as well. We have some of our youth legal workers on the call. We run bi-monthly legal nights um, specifically to support youth advocacy. Our next one is on March 30th. Um, and so if you follow us, I'm gonna put info on Integrate and PDP in the chat. Um, if you follow us, you can send a request in for legal information or to be paired with an attorney specific to your um, area of interest. And so we will help to facilitate connections and share information. Um, and so I'll, I'll share those two things in the chat as well. Um, wondering if ASAP has anything also you wanna bump Naomi or CAC? Oh yeah, so this isn't just for students, this is for everyone. Um, well, one of my colleagues at CACF is going to be hosting an in-person event on the theme of Black and Asian solidarity on Monday night. I'm going to put the link to that in the chat and there will be food and lots of lots of very interesting talk. This is this is this is for anybody. So if you're interested, please register. More specifically, the theme for this one is Black and Asian solidarity and um, school public school curriculum. Yeah. So I wanted to just go back a little bit and also address Paulette's question about you know AAPI students and acknowledging their struggles with disability because. I I definitely feel you on that one. I think especially within like at least I can say like in the East Asian community, disability is definitely a negative word. Um, so like my background is, you know, Chinese Korean and for sure if a family member has a disability, they're seen a, a little bit as a burden. And a lot of it is because of, you know, like the cultural connotations and also there are not a lot of resources for um, disabled people just historically. And so I think it really comes down to speaking their tongue. I definitely feel like we need more people who speak Korean, who speak Mandarin, who speak even the dialects within um, the countries themselves. It can make a huge difference. 
and just educating the parents and the family that there are opportunities. This does not have to be the end of the line. I think like the largest issue is, you know, the fear that, oh my God, if my child doesn't get into one of these fancy schools, what else is going to be there for them? They, they don't have any more choices. They're already limited in their abilities, but that's because the system does perpetuate that. And also they don't have the resources to look outside of whatever they're currently seeing. So I definitely think it, it really comes down to like having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Like it has to be a personal thing. I personally don't feel that it's really effective to send out, you know, mass emails or, you know, things like flyers, like, oh, come join a meeting. It's a, it's very, it's a privileged position to be in, to join meetings and to be like, yeah, I'm an advocate. Most parents don't have the time. They don't understand what's going on. They don't, they don't, they frankly don't really care at this moment in time. They have other issues. So if you can, so we can concentrate on our efforts into finding those families and saying, we're here to support you one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't have to be this big thing. It doesn't have to be this rally, this protest, this, you know, large scale conversation. It makes a huge difference. Um, I think I've noticed that, especially when I communicate with um, Asian community members, I've done translation work in the past and it takes a lot for you know Asian people to open up. I do think it takes a, a long conversation. It takes you knowing their language and empathizing with them and coming from their community. So I definitely understand where you're coming from. And you know, it's it's a continuous effort. I mean, we, we've been trying to do it in partnership with some of our local electeds, you know, it's like they'll help us, they'll help us bring in a resource and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to provide, you know, um, translators from their offices, you know, who speak the different languages. We, we understand like, even within, you know, um, the, the different communities of Chinatown across, you know, um, across our city, there's different dialects. There's, there's also, you know, um, members from other Asian countries, like within, that, that that community as well. So, you know, language access has been a huge hindrance in terms of us really bringing our community together. But the few times we've been able to, to coordinate it, it was well attended. I mean, we, we I think we're, we're at a precipice now where it's like, there is a lot of movement in the AAPI community about special education, you know, cause it's like our children are getting to the fifth grade and they, they're still not proficient in, in reading. And it's like, you know, they're being misdiagnosed because, you know, they think just because this is the face that they see, they, that kid can't be dyslexic, that kid must have, you know, it must be an English language problem, you know, and it's like, and with this new screening that's coming through from the DOE, you know, it's like, this is, this is really like, you know, an opportune time to really like, you know, strike when the iron is hot type of thing. But, you know, like if there's a way that CACF can support us, by sending someone who can help us translate during, you know, one of these local meetings, that's going to build community. That's going to build awareness, you know, and we're going to need this type of awareness for the long haul if we're going to continue fighting the segregation that is put into place from the specialized high schools. So, you know, I appreciate your, your, your feedback and I just wanted to let you know, like, what's, what's going on right now? You know, we are chipping away at it and it's like, you know, having the few meetings that we've been able to do because of the various coordinations we've been able to get um, were very well attended. So that's giving us an idea that this is a huge issue that people want more information on. We're just struggling to provide it in the languages that they need. So, I mean, I guess that's my ask, like, you know, can CACF partner with us? You know, those of us who are doing this grassroots, you know, type of service, because the DOE certainly isn't doing it, um, you know, in order to kind of like bolster awareness you know, letting people know what their rights are, knowing that they have support, you know, um, that's really the biggest crux. What we hear on the ground level, you know, are, are the fact that parents are like, I don't know where to go for help, you know, um, and even like organizations like Include NYC, you know, um, Synergia, like, like, you know, special advocate, you know, um, organizations, they don't have the capacity when it comes to languages for AAPI community so you know maybe we can we can build a bridge somewhere here um because it's much needed and it would we would be able to help out so many more families if we had additional organizations 
to help us facilitate the language access barrier. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. I, I'm not a part of CACF, so I won't speak for them, but um, with Integrate, we have a lot of, you know, bilingual, like young people and stuff. Like I personally, myself, I love translation work. Like I would love to do something like that. And I definitely see that when familiar faces come back, it's much easier for the parents to develop that trust and to open up and like translation services are so like, they're so underrated, but it's great that, you know, parents are beginning to come and seek help. And I think that's largely to do with, you know, how like the Asian community has really shown up and shown out for like the past two years. So I, I love that elected officials are also taking note and giving us the space to do that as well. I see a hand raised, um, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amy, and I'm also an advocate along with Paulette in the educational uh, world. Um, and I, I just, I don't want to question, but I just had like a, um, a thought that I wanted to share. Um, you know, I am um, Asian American, uh, born in New York City, and, you know, hearing from everyone who's shared so far, um, cultural responsiveness is something that uh, touched my heart because, you know, I am a mom uh, who is um, who's Asian American, but also have uh, children who are biracial. And so uh, living in the borough of the Bronx, I am the minority of the majority of black and brown Latinx um, families in the Bronx. Um, so I don't, I don't feel like I'm a nanny because the reality is that a lot of times AAPI communities are larger than just the East Asian population. It, it includes our South Asian populations as well. And I don't think that people have recognized those South Asian communities enough or to support them enough so that you no, know, they get the support and resources that they also need in their languages, in the materials that they need, in the support, in the community that they need, not just within the radius of their own community, uh, wherever they live. Um, I think that a lot of times, um, you know, these grassroots large organizations um, like AEF and CACF and uh, Coalition for Educational Justice, who I also is like a leader of, um, and I've seen the works happen, but I don't feel that the range that we are reaching are also um, at the level of other communities than just the communities we think of when it comes to API communities like Chinatown or Flushing in New York or, or Sunset Park or, or certain parts of uh, clusters throughout New York City. Um, and I kind of relate to this because we, you know, right before the pandemic hit, you know, we were facing anti Asian hate across the nation. And Boston was one of those conversations where, you know, where as we, as minor, the model minorities fit, um, where, where do we stand, especially for Asian Americans that are born here versus our families, our parents who are from their nations that have culturally been, um, you know, a certain way and, and certain like traditions that sometimes we, we kind of break apart and I think a lot of the Asian Americans themselves feel there's a there's a segregation as well and so I, I just wanted to kind of share out that there's more conversations other than what we think here I think us just brainstorming of like how many other organizations out there that are from the Mangali, Mangala, Bangladesh communities or from the Filipino community. There's just so many out there that I don't think we have reached as much, especially, you know, a lot of our Filipino uh, communities that are educators in early childhood. You know, there's so much to share out. And I think we all have a story to tell. I don't think we've been given people the opportunity to listen. And I think the pandemic reflects that we are all um, people of color, we are all minorities, we are um, all people who have suffered through history and that we still continue to. And I feel like there's more share out. So I just wanted to share that. And thank you for the space this afternoon um, for reflecting 
the New York City public school system. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely hear you, Amy. Um, that's that's an issue that we're that we're always discussing. You know, how do we include the broader like AAPI community? Uh, so personally, like I'm from Queens, so I I am familiar with working with groups that are like primarily serving like the Daisy population, or um, you know Filipinos. The Indonesian community is large in Queens as well. So there are definitely folks that we we should be looping in, and we should also be hearing from. But um, yeah, I think like the Asian movement in general is is strong and is large, and um, it's it's great to see that there are you know more specialized groups um, in the mix as well. Because I agree, it shouldn't just be Chinatown. You know, it should also be about like Little Manila. It should be about Little Bangladesh and um, other places in New York City. Anyone have any um, closing questions, uh, concerns, ideas that they'd like to share in the space? I will be sharing this recording with our panelists um, and getting their consent to share it publicly. Um, and I really appreciate the beginning of this conversation. Just wanted to make space here. If there's anything else folks would like to share or elevate or request for resources. And if, and I wanted to put my email in the chat for you all, just in case you wanted to reach out or if you wanted to receive any of the resources that we shared in this call by email. Um, but again, um, thank you all so much for coming and please check out the ways to get involved message in the chat. Um, and yeah, hope to see you all again soon. Thanks for a great discussion and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.